All right, hello everybody, and welcome to the very first edition of Mogary's Code Slash. I am Gergo, also known as Mogary, and we are live on Algora uh, to discuss my contributions to the open source projects that I've done through Algora, and also how I got started, what my setup is like, and basically my thoughts on how someone can succeed as a developer on Algora. So uh, let's jump right in. So this is my profile. Um, I have done a couple of bounties. Uh, most of them have been with three projects. So I did the first one at cal.com. That's really what got me started with doing Algora in the first place. And then I really worked on two different types of bounties. And the difference between these makes them really interesting, but we are going to talk about this later. So the very first thing um, was this cal.com issue. It was ICS feed support for checking against double bookings. So cal.com is a scheduling website. Basically, you get a link and if you send that link to anyone, then they can schedule an event in your calendar. It's uh, super clean, super useful. A lot of people use it. I like it personally. And it's, uh, it's, it's really just a great product and they are also open source. So uh, this issue was opened about ICS feed support. So calendars, uh, you have a lot of different uh, calendar formats or ways to grab calendar events. So you have CalDAV, which is sort of like a hosted, uh, like a more managed server thing. And you also have a raw ICS feed that just contains calendar events and you can parse them and do stuff with them. So as well as like uh, more managed integrations like a Google Calendar, Cal.com also supported CalDAV, which lets anyone connect to a calendar server, but it did not support ICS feeds. Now, the thing is that these two are kind of similar. So it was uh, kind of easy to add this and it struck me as a good first issue potentially. So I took a look at this issue. One thing that you may notice is that this is actually really old. So this was on Algora for a while before I uh, came across it. And um, Yeah, so it was added to Algora on the 9th of October. And I came across it um, in January of this year. So January 17th, I started my attempt. And I was really uh, a bit worried because it's not really easy to get accustomed to a new code base that you are working on. So that was something that I especially wanted to sort of develop in myself, that skill to adapt to different code bases. But also more of a technical issue was to actually get cal.com set up and running on my machine. So uh, I was just uh, browsing their readme file uh, about the development stuff and I saw that they had something called a git pod setup and this actually came really in clutch. So what git pod does is you can log in with github and you can create a workspace of a github repository. You can say, okay, yeah, VS code, it's fine. Uh, you have uh, sort of machine classes and then you can open this 
and it basically creates a VM for you that has uh, everything installed that you need to run a project. It's really cool. I can actually do, okay, yeah, allow. So if we take a bit here, it's going to install an extension and it's going to open, but that's not really what I'm concerned about right now. So uh, not every repo has this, but especially if they have this or if they have GitHub code spaces integration, that is a really, really good way to just immediately jump into a project. So this is what I used for the first time. Uh, and then I actually went on to build my own solution for being able to do this with other projects that may not, may not have this set up. But let's uh, talk about that later. So if we take a look at my PR here, uh, this was not really something that was super difficult. If I remember correctly, I did this in an evening. Um, I actually took a bit to get around to it, but it was, I would come home after school and just hack away on this. And then I eventually opened this PR. So if you take a look at this, the main thing that I did was I had to sort of look at how apps work in cal.com, where they are set up. They actually have some super useful tooling that will generate apps for you, but it's not really well-rounded. There are some things that it cannot do. So I did have to actually uh, take a look at what's going on in order to find everything that I needed to get this set up. Um, so what I did basically is I knew that their CalDAV app was very similar to this one. So I just searched for it in the code base and I saw, okay, it's there and it's here and it's there. So I tried to replicate its behavior with my new ICS feed app. Um, and the whole ICS feed calendar API is also based on the CalDAV API. So a lot of this stuff uh, especially this um, iCal parsing is just taken from the CalDev code because I was able to recycle it really quickly. Um, of course, it's not ideal to copy paste code, but uh, it wasn't really like um, compartmentalized anywhere that I could just call into it. So I did have to duplicate this code, unfortunately, but it did work and everything's fine. So, uh, yeah, I added this app. I did a little bit of testing, a little bit of UI uh, I had to do for the actual setup page that the app goes through. So, yeah. And then we also have an SVG icon that I had to make. This is also based on the CalDev icon. It is basically the same icon, but it said CalDev instead of ICS here. So what I did is I just opened Inkscape and uh, replaced CalDev with ICS. Um, but yeah, so this is something that struck me as a good first issue, not only because it was kind of trivial with the pre-existing functionality, but also because it was a good opportunity to practice getting into a code base. So that's really what, what struck me about it. Uh, I did, of course, have to have like pre-existing knowledge that, oh, okay, because it uses CalDev, it's probably easy because it already, already has iCal. But of course, if you know different things, then you can apply this to different projects and you can be successful there. So this was something that was I was pretty comfortable with. I've used iCal before. I've used basically everything uh, in the tech stack of Cal.com. So that's what really struck me as, okay, if I'm going to start with something, I need to start with this. It's been a long standing issue. It hasn't been touched in a long, long time. If I fix this, some people are going to be really happy about it, which is always cool. And yeah. So this got merged. This was probably the easiest or like one of the most easy merge processes um, that I've had on Algora. I don't really have to chase uh, maintainers for this one. They just pulled it in when the time came. Very cool. 
so yeah, that's basically it about this and just the ability to open this Git pod and not actually have to install everything on my local machine and clutter everything up. Uh, that's really what made me sure that I need to set something up like this. So after I did this, I actually started researching ways to create a workspace, uh, something like a GitHub workspace, but or sorry, code space, but locally, because I have a big tower PC that I mainly used for gaming. I don't really use it anymore because I don't game that much anymore, but I had the resources so that I wouldn't need to rent it. And basically what I ended up doing is I found this project called Coder and it lets you set up these deployment templates of like Docker containers, node containers. So these are development containers. So what these containers do is that you have a Terraform file here that sort of sets up stuff. Uh, this is not really important, but you have something called a Jesus Christ, what is this music? Give me a second. Okay. Um, so yeah, you have this Terraform file. Ooh. Give me a second here. My encoding is overloaded. You have this Terraform file that, um, that defines like, okay, create this Docker container, create this, um, create this Docker container, create these, like install these, uh, Docker file and run this launch script. Uh, and what you can do with that is you can create sort of deterministic, uh, developer environments and you can recreate them and spin up, uh, spin them up really easily. So yeah, that allows you to create sort of these disposable dev machines that you can uh, install everything on and mess up without actually affecting your main machine. And so I like to code on my, uh, my laptop. It is a uh, M1 MacBook Air with eight gigs of RAM. So it's not, it's not bad, but it's not su a super capable machine. So my solution for that was to set up this, uh, this coder instance. And I made, so this is the default Docker container that you have, but I created like a rust environment, a node container, uh, so that I could just spin one of these up and start developing instantly. So you can see all the mendable stuff I did is in a container. All the tail call stuff I did is in the container. There's also quadrant and so on. So I have the tail call one here and I just say VS code desktop and I pick the folder and it's actually here. This is, this is the remote one. So it's, it says here coder and I can just edit code here. If I open a terminal, I can use git here. Fine. It automatically pulls in my SSH keys and that sort of stuff. I can run, uh, an HTTP server and it will automatically forward ports. It is just awesome. Anyway, uh, so let's move on. Once I had this set up, I, uh, was browsing for more issues on Agora. And because I had such a success with solving, uh, an older issue, I started to look for older issues that haven't been, uh, touched in a while. So the issue that I actually started doing after that was tail calls at a showcase URL. Let me just close these tabs. This was not a good idea. Um, so yeah, uh, tail call is a GraphQL uh, sort of server or gateway. Uh, what it can do is you can write a configuration in a in the sort of like the GraphQL description language, like this, 
and you can tell uh, so you can define the GraphQL like uh, schema that your server will have and you can tell the actual server where to pull this data from so you can pull it from HTTP for example so you can say okay this is the base URL that we are pulling from and pull the posts from path posts so if you query for posts all these posts will be retrieved from this slash posts um, super simple and also super useful especially uh, what I found it pretty cool for is you can kind of set it up to transform a private API to a public API like call your internal stuff but in the right way make sure that it's actually valid uh, in this GraphQL layer uh, which is pretty cool so you can use it for a bunch of stuff even if you just have an HTTP API and you need the GraphQL thing for some reason you can just slap this into it I actually worked on the AWS integration as well so you can just deploy it as a Lambda soon that's hopefully going out soon uh, but you can also just host it on any like an EC2 server or any server you can just run and that is all uh, it's written in rust it's pretty fast yeah that's basically all uh, but they wanted to build a showcase endpoint so if you have this showcase endpoint um, you can give it a config URL in the parameters and actually so if you have this uh, config here it loads it from here and it actually parses it and runs creates like an app context based on it and you can query this config so even without setting up your own tail call instance you can play around with how tail call works uh, which is very cool uh, so I immediately jumped on this, even though I knew basically next to zero about tail call uh, when I was doing this. Uh, or sorry, not, well, also tail call, but it, even GraphQL I knew next to nothing about when I jumped in on this. I, did, I do know a lot of Rust. I code Rust pretty frequently, so that's what gave me the confidence to do this. But the uh issue was actually pretty useful uh so they have hints like similar code is written in cloudflare handle so i kind of could read that to see how this is supposed to work and sure unit tests are added i had to explore the sort of unit test system that they had at the time uh which was cool and then this is just boring stuff of like okay add a feature flag of course then you're gonna have to jump into the config parsing layer to see where you can add a showcase parameter to the server directive and so on. So uh, what I noticed is this is not proper uh, like Agora etiquette, but I noticed a lot of people like, so, sorry, so Tailcall has it set up that you cannot claim it immediately. You have to be assigned. And people were like, can I get assigned? Can I get assigned? Can I get assigned? And it's like, um it was like i i like i didn't see anyone getting assigned so i just did it it's not great you can do this in other places i'm not recommending that you do this uh but yeah that's what i did it's not it's not the best thing to do um so i added so i opened a pr for this um and then Let's see what I changed. So I had to do this actually took um, an amount of going back and forth. Uh, so what I did is I joined the uh, Discord and then I could uh, talk more directly with the maintainers and that was super useful. Um, but as you can see, there was like a good amount of iteration that had to happen on here. Even uh, like the initial structure that I did was kind of in unclean because of the way this is set up. So Telco basically has these IO abstractions like HTTP IO, file IO, and IO because it can run on so many platforms and those platforms may not necessarily have like a 
compatible HTTP implementations with each other. So what I did is I took an input for HTTP IO and I think, yeah, basically HTTP IO, uh, because that's really what showcase needed. And then for file IO and NVIO, I created dummy ones because they were still required in like downstream functions that I was calling, but I didn't really want to implement them because they could like pose security risks. So if you had like just a public instance running showcase and you had file IO available to the showcase function, it could read local files based on the config parameter, which is not, not ideal. Um, so I created these dummy file IO stuff. Du, du, du. Yeah, dummy file IO, uh, just because I needed to pass something to these downstream functions. And that didn't turn out to be the preferred solution. So there was a lot of back and forth on this. Also, just the way this project worked, there was a lot of like downstream, a lot of like simultaneous API changes going on internally. So I also had to like, okay, fix. Okay, I think I can find a commit here that says keep up with changes. But yeah, that's basically what I use. Keep up with API changes. Yeah, so if someone else changes something, you do have to go back in and fix what has been changed. Um, yeah, uh, but this was, uh, so this was a long process because it was a complicated thing to do. Uh, and also, uh, I just, this was like a project where I really had to like, um, actively talk with the maintainers to, to get things shipped, um, which is not an issue of course, but it is something that you have to do on Agora that you wouldn't necessarily have to do, uh, somewhere else and like if you were like working on your own project, of course, you don't have anyone to chase after. Um, so that was unexpected actually to me, just the amount of like social battery that I needed to like keep, keep these things going. Um, so I opened this, um, it was a straightforward thing. Um, well, it seemed like a straightforward thing. Turns out it wasn't, uh, this actually got a spin-off PR that changed some underlying API stuff. And then we could actually um, do this in a clean way. So this took quite a bit of time to get resolved. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I was also doing some other technical stuff, but I was also um, looking at other bounties and Mendable kind of struck me as one that I could do. Uh, so Mendable AI is, they're an AI company essentially. Let me show you their landing page real quick. Is this gonna load? My computer does not particularly like me right now. Not sure what's going on. Probably feels just those better stuff. Hopefully that fixes it. Oof. Okay. Anyway, I'm not going to deal with that right now. But Mendable is um they are basically uh training resource. Um, so you can like sort of consume your docs and your knowledge base and um you can you can basically like um jesus so you can basically consume your uh, your docs and your knowledge space on your knowledge base and you can create an ai chatbot based off of that um which is a pretty cool idea i don't know why i just opened it here, give me a second here. I am very sorry. 
This is not going well. But uh, yeah. So a lot of people use this and they are they started to source their tickers, which actually lets you put your internal sub that you use. And uh, yeah, uh, that was it. so basically they wanted to uh, have a ticker in this repo that let you uh, ingest data from a public GitHub repository. Uh, and the It struck me as a little weird at first because okay 30 bucks is not a whole lot it's not like the 200 and the 400 that i was making from cal.com or telco um uh, but i did actually go for it because it just seemed something that would be quick and easy uh it turned out to be quick didn't really turn out to be easy they also had uh so one thing that really signaled to me that this was going to be quick is they said other attempts so do not start working on this before getting assigned otherwise we can award a bounty other attempts will be allowed if the user assigned does not open a pr within 48 hours so you have two days to do this and they also said if merged and is of high quality within 24 hours of the assignment a 10 dollar tip will be award added so what this signaled to me is that they are on top of their shit. And this will be, if I can put the work in to get this done quick, then this will be quick. And there won't be a lot of back and forth. There won't be a lot of sort of like refactoring that will have to be done. So I uh, jumped on this after the time expired. And I opened a PR uh, the same day, I think, or like maybe the day after um so yeah uh, i actually encountered a good amount of issues with this one github was so github has a really tough rate limit based on uh on your authentication level so if you are unauthenticated uh, you are you are not you don't have an identity of, okay, I'm this user making these calls. If you are unauthorized, then um, then you can only make, I think, 50 requests in five minutes. Uh, yeah, 50 requests per five minutes, which is not enough to scrape a repo, like however big or small it is, it's just simply not. Uh, so I actually had to add a github um, authentication method so the original scope was a public github integration which you need uh sign in but that just wasn't feasible unfortunately but what what i could actually do is I could add this authentication stuff and it would work with private repos also, which is super cool because they did eventually want to build a private repo integration as well. So um, the so the project structure of this one was actually really, really easy to grasp and super cool uh, just because it's really just like, it's meant to be a modular thing so I could just look at any one of them, see where they were the, the, the where they were declared, and I could just repeat that, which was super easy and super useful. Um, I also where was this? Um, so I also had to add. Um, oof, this is not like me right now. I did Octokit because they said use Octokit. Um, 
you can like use Axios for this if you don't want to increase the project footprint, but it was just, yeah, sure, off took it. Um, so what they wanted is they wanted like uh, a document only mode. So you can either ingest everything, including the code or only documents, which is like more down, more down X, uh, text and uh, RST. Um, so that's the clear here. We have a little helper function. I can actually just run through this code really quick because it's not a lot. Uh, so they have like a data provider uh, cause that is implemented by every provider, which is super nice. Um, and they also support something called Nango, which is super cool. And I'm going to show it to you. Uh, Nango sort of centralizes all your OAuth secrets and all your OAuth providers. So you can just integrate with everything and just like add it to your project really easy. They basically have an API wrapper built in as well, but I'm not using that because of the kid. Um, but you can just set up authorization really quickly without like configuring config variables in your environment file and stuff like that. Um, so this is very, very cool. They actually use this. So it was super easy to test things with this. Um, yeah, so I went in and added regular authorization, um, Nango authorization, which is really easy. Um, and then the get documents is like the heart of this. It, it determines the default branch if you didn't um, define a branch in the config. And it gets the branch, it gets the Git tree. This is like a really obscure part of the GitHub API. So it was kind of hard to be able to Google for this. Um, let me move my camera real quick, just because it's in an unfortunate place. Um, so you have the Git tree here, and then you get the files from it. You, uh, if, if it's only, if the configuration says only import files from here, then I check the path. Um, and then if doc only I filter by extensions and then I just get the blobs. Uh, this is what really killed uh, the, the limit. Just that you have to uh, get the, get each blob. Um, it's just too API call consuming. And yeah, then I had to guess on some stuff. I just added like uh, GitHub comments for that because it was unclear a little bit what was supposed to happen. Um, so I just added that stuff for that. And then we have document type. Uh, I wasn't sure because it wasn't defined like anywhere, like what this is. Uh, turns out it's just like, fed to the AI, so it doesn't really matter like what it is. So you can just write everything there, that's pretty cool. And then the rest is just boilerplate and just adding tests, which was also easy because Mango is awesome. Um, yeah, so adding a GitHub provider to this was really fast and just the whole like rundown of, okay, I am adding this and then, okay, it's merged and I get rewarded was what, like a day. I think Nick reviewed it the same day I, I submitted it, which is awesome. Um, and then, yeah. I got, I also got a tip for 20 bucks, which was cool. And it was just really fast and it wasn't. So this is what I meant when I said that these two are very different types of projects. So tail call, you have to uh, do a lot of work um, and it's not really fast, but the rewards are bigger. And amendable is just quick things that you can uh, do. And the run through is really quick. But, but the rewards are smaller. Um, you will find projects of both kinds on Agora. 
Um, but this is my personal experience with these. So I also added a Notion data provider, a driver data provider, a conference data provider, a Salesforce, Salesforce data connector. And what was really interesting is that because I, I jumped on the GitHub one and got it done, then I jumped on the, Let's close everything else. Then I got on the Notion one and I was already tagged by Nick to uh, work on this. And then I was uh, on the Jira one. I think I was tagged by, oh no, I also jumped on this by myself. Or no, yeah, I was also asked by Nick to get on this and then on the confluence one, which was particularly horrible. Oh no, sorry. I think it was the Salesforce one that was bad, but I don't know where, but someone tagged me here to get on it. I think it was Rishi. I don't know why can't see it now anyway so just by like building something really fast and really quality uh, really high quality you can get a reputation as someone who can do these sorts of things i also saw this with i think digital phoenix i'm not sure i'm remembering that name correctly but with refact they did a lot of stuff with refact and I scrolled back and that's how they did it. If I remember correctly, is that they were there at the beginning, they solved an issue really well and they just became the go-to person to do this kind of stuff, which is awesome. And you are not too late to actually do something like this. There are new projects joining Agora and yeah, it's totally something like you can just become a key player for a certain type of task in a project, which is very cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I also did some fun things in here, like in the Notion data connect the data connector. I actually had to uh, write a Markdown converter to convert like Notion blocks to Markdown, uh, which is pretty like nasty but it does like actually work and run well. So it was cool. Uh, and then I, I because I wrote this, I could also borrow this code to uh, work on Jira and Confluence and so on and so forth. So that was basically what I did for Mandible. And then uh, the more interesting stuff uh, that I did is uh, on tail call actually with the execution spec snapshot testing framework, which was really cool. I think this is one of my coolest projects. Um, so what, uh, what they wanted was, uh, basically they had like two sort of test suites that they had a GraphQL spec which was kind of like four test types in itself of like, you could provide a server file and make sure that it errors and that the error message is valid. You could provide a server file and make sure that it builds uh, and that the client schema is correct. You could also provide a server file and run a GraphQL query on it, like just like raw. Uh, not even like end to end, but just like on the GraphQL part. Uh, so you could do a lot of stuff. You could also test merging multiple uh, GraphQL server uh, SDLs to test that behavior. <clears throat> and they also had a different thing called HTTP spec. And that was the end to end thing where you could define a config, a GraphQL config. And then you had the sort of uh, mock endpoints and assertions and then you could, so the config would target the mock endpoint to get the data, and then the assertion would query the server uh, 
uh, to make sure that the config actually works. Uh, but this, like, there were at least two types of files in like different places, which was um, pretty messy. And so they wanted uh, someone to create a new uh, testing, uh, an execution spec, uh, testing like spec um, that combined all these and would actually uh, merge HTTP spec and GraphQL spec. And they basically wanted it to be written in Markdown. So you can write config, here's your config, assert, here's your assert, and then the assert will target the config. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, and I jumped on this ASAP. Um, let's see, because this is actually pretty overwhelming. So they used the Insta, so I, yeah, I was asked to use the Insta snapshot framework, which is something really cool. I'm not sure I can pull it up right now. Hopefully that's the right page. Hopefully. Oh, why is it blue? Oh, right. This is blue. Oh God. Oh God. Okay. My browser is dying. <laughs> yeah. So here we have Insta snapshots. Uh, so it's a sort of like a snapshot testing framework where you don't actually write assertions. You create snapshots of your uh, output that you would normally assert. And then if the snapshot is different from the last snapshot that was created, it fails. And then if it was expected to fail because your output changed, then you can just quickly accept the new snapshot. Or if it fails because the output is wrong and your code is wrong, then you can fix your code and wait for it to match the snapshot actually, which is pretty cool. Uh, you don't really have to rewrite a lot of tests when you change something that actually should be changed. Um, you can just auto accept the snapshots, which is great. Um, getting this to work was a bit difficult just because of the sort of messy stuff in rust testing and just like rust serialization in general uh so i had to i think at some point i had to like enable a weird feature flag on serda json to get json to serialize to re retain the order of json keys so that the snapshot wouldn't just like dance around and fail um which was interesting, but it did work. So hopefully I can pull this up. 497 files changed because one of the uh, requirements was also to write a, um, to write a test converter and actually convert be able to automatically convert every single pre-existing test to use the execution spec format, uh, which was also something that was pretty cool to do. I may actually have to open this in VS code because GitHub is just dying right now. So now that we are in VS code, uh, link const file, do I want that? Yeah, sure. Actually, that's fine. Ooh, yeesh. It is not happy. Okay, let's see what I can close. I just close everything else but this. Yes, I can. Okay, Th that should be better. Eight gigs of RAM is not enough for this machine. Anyway. So we have execution spec right here. Uh, this is uh, what's used to uh, parse the markdown spec and actually like perform it. Uh, I based this off of the pre-existing like HTTP spec um, and GraphQL spec, which doesn't actually exist anymore. 
I think. Yeah, the directory is empty. Um, but yeah, I was basically able to use that to create my own spec. Uh, and then we have something like test. Uh, yeah, test no base URL. So this is what I was talking about. You can test, you can make sure that it errors out. So you say, okay, SDL error. So this is expected to error out. And then you define the server that's just wrong. And so if we take a look at test no base URL uh, snap, uh, you can see that this was the error that was outputted by this. And that's what's verified again on every test run. So there's also a bunch of this, like sometimes you need it to uh, explicitly define that you wanted to perform like a merge check, which meant that for every single time you edit the merge stuff, you needed to, uh, you usually needed to create a normal test of like an HTTP spec test that actually tests what you are doing. And then you also needed to create a merge test, uh, because you changed the merge stuff. I don't know. You added a config parameter or something. And then you should have created a, a test for that. Sometimes that wasn't done and sometimes, uh, stuff failed. So now I, uh, added that everything is automatically merge tested. Um, so that you don't need to declare that, um, explicitly it's automatically done every for everything, which increases the coverage, um, a considerable amount. I also wrote a doc for this, uh, which basically describes like how things are supposed to be written, but I think we can learn better from example here. So let's see test JS hello world. I don't know if the virtual file system is in here yet. Yes, it is. Okay. That's cool. I'll talk about that later. So you have a server block right here, which describes your GraphQL server. Uh, I don't know what this is doing. Uh, and then you have an assertion block that actually runs the request. And then, uh, so as you can see, there's no like uh, expected response here. So it's not technically an assertion, but it is because if you do test.js hello world md assert zero dot snap, then you can see that this is the response. This is the expected response. It was automatically generated by a known good build. So this is the accept, expected response snapshot. And then if you break something, uh, it detects that you, the actual data does not match the snapshot and then it fails. So you have the assertion here. This just describes, okay, call this and with this query. Um, and then this is the server config. And you can actually do stuff like link JavaScript to it. So you can like, um, script some stuff. Uh, so for that, we, uh, I also added a, like a, a mock file system. So you can just dis define files. So you can say, okay, file test.js, JS, and then it's just, um, it just, your file is here. And if you say, okay, open test.js then the mock file IO that I created, uh, reads this, which is cool. Um, it, it, the, really just the point was to be able to cent centralize everything into one file that is needed for one test case or test spec. Um, you can also do stuff like, Oh, one thing that's also done is if you have a server, um, block anywhere, it also automatically generates a client. So all that client specs are, are, the, are those, uh, GraphQL specs that check the client generation are now also obsolete and are automatically done for everything and even more cases that were done before. So you can say execution spec. Uh, test JS hello world client. And here's the client that was generated. Um, so this is 
pretty straightforward. The magic actually happened in Testcom, which automatically converted everything to to, 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 to the, the new format. So if I open Testcom here, so what it does is it's pretty big just because it had to handle like a lot of stuff. So it opens the old tests, reads everything from them and sort of tries to parse them. So for example, the HTTP specs were in YAML. So it parses them. It basically turns uh, and it, yeah, so it emits um, markdown that can be put straight into the new execution spec file. And there were some stuff in the original format, like uh, fail annotations um, saying that, okay, this is expected to fail, that we couldn't actually support in the new version um, because you cannot really, Insta doesn't like let you expect a snapshot to fail because that's kind of dumb. If you expect it to fail, then just save the failing snapshot is the philosophy there. So what we do is exactly that. So if we detect that uh, there's a fail annotation, we actually run the test suite and save the failing snapshot, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is repeated for everything else. Um, there's all sort of edge cases that need to be handled, which took most of the time when building this test comp, but yeah. Uh, and it automatically runs prettier because you want your execution spec to be formatted. Um, so yeah, this, the test comp was the most complicated thing of, uh, in this. Um, in execution spec, it was pretty easy because I used a, like a markdown parser that created uh, an ast tree uh, that I could just walk and get everything and turn it into a Rust like struct. So this was really uh, just a super interesting thing to tackle, which really helped me because I could really use this basically fun project to keep my motivation up while also doing stuff that was a little bit hard or inconvenient or demotivating. Um, so you should always just like have a a bounty going in the background that is actually like really interesting to you even if it's not like really high reward maybe or it, it especially if you're doing like a lot of other bounties that feel like scott work it can really help a lot to be doing uh, a bounty at the same time that you can just go back to and work away at it if if you just need a break or need to do something else um yeah, so that's basically um, everything. Uh, there's also one more uh, thing, telco contribution that we can talk about that is uh, a bit interesting. We have AWS Lambda and I just, I was really banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out like what's an elegant way to do this. And I actually ended up using Terraform to create a deployment, which is a super useful tool, not only if you want to like set up your project for yourself, but also if you want to allow someone else to set up your project in as, as a part of their own deployment. So if we take a look here, I don't think that one is merged yet, but we can go to Mogary Tell Call on AWS. There we go. So what this does, it's it's basically just a Terraform file. But if you wanted to put if you wanted to deploy Telcall on AWS, this is the only repo that you need to clone. And the only thing that you need to have installed is Terraform because what it actually does is it pulls the latest Lambda build from the Telcall GitHub releases page. So you don't need to really build anything on your own. Um, 
if you, you just get the tail call binary from from the releases um which is pretty cool and it also gives you auto updating so if you if you deploy your uh, project if you redeploy your project or if you update i think that's the terraform term if you update the project then you can just uh so what this does is it always gets the latest tail call release so if terraform just detects that you have a new release of tail call than the one that was last deployed uh it just downloads it again reconstructs the zip and puts it on aws uh so terraform is really just a, a super like useful tool to ship stuff that has great dx because infrastructure as code is the best DX that you can give when you are trying to help people deploy stuff. So this will be the end product of the whole AWS thing. Uh, it's not super ready yet, mainly because I was busy with other things uh, and I wasn't really available to drive this. But as you can see, there are already like, um, not polls, why didn't I go to polls? I meant to go to releases. So if you check the tail call releases, you can already see like, um, tail call ABS, AWS and then the bootstrap. So you, so yeah, that's the bootstrap image that goes out to the GitHub releases and that gets pulled, um, when you are deploying to AWS. We also had just an issue of, okay, how are we going to configure tail call because tail call needs a configuration that you need to be able to deploy uh, along with your image so what i actually ended up doing is if you go if you go to aws lambda uh, you can see that it's actually read from just a local file on the lambda machine and what I actually ended up finding most convenient is bundling this, uh, this config file uh, with, the, with the image itself. So that allows you to not really need to go to like some AWS panel and upload your config into there. You can just update your config.graphql here. And when you update it, tell call will detect that you've changed the file. It will rebuild the, the bootstrap zip and it'll upload it to Lambda and it will be up there. You can try this better DX than TF. Oh, Pulumi. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pulumi is also awesome. I ended up going with TF uh, because it was just the thing that I had most experience with. Uh, that actually came from the coder stuff. But it's, it, I think it's definitely something that, that, uh multiple of these infrastructure as code solutions can do and i think the best thing would be to implement all of them so it, if you are deploying tail call to aws you can just choose if you are already using an infrastructure as code project or like solution then you can just choose the one that's written in the same thing and you can sort of like intertwine it with what you are already deploying so yeah absolutely Bloomy is also awesome um and i think that's definitely something that needs to be added here once we get this first initial version merged i'm actually writing that down thank you for reminding me about that um yeah that is it, I think. I don't really have anything more planned today. Um, I unfortunately have to work on non-Agora stuff today, 
otherwise I was I, I would be just live working on some interesting stuff but that is not really something I can do unfortunately but that will be something that I will definitely do in the future in this Mogri's Code Sessions format. Uh, so look out for that. But I think that that is it, unless uh, anybody has any questions in the chat. Let me see if there's anything else that I missed. Yeah, so support files inspect. This was what added um, the virtual file system to uh, the execution spec. And what was really cool about this is while I was doing it, I just felt that I've I've like messed with this code base enough to be able to do something like this. And that's really something that you can do by jumping uh, between all these bounties is you can just really like develop that skill of being able to adapt to other people's code and being able to look at it and actually understand. It's not something that will be easy for the first time. I, I've struggled with this a lot, but I've also been doing like, I've been looking at code for like 10 years now. So it's, it's obviously something that you get better with over time, but just because of doing other bounties, I I just knew enough about other bounties in Telco. I mean, I just know enough about the code base to be able to just go in confidently and build this because I already knew where everything was. And that is what's great about doing bounties for the same projects. And that is also great, but if you hop between projects, you will get better at this even more. So really, you don't really have to like, uh, like pick a strategy of, of like, okay, I'm going to work on this project only, or okay, I'm going, I'm never going to work on the same project again. And I always want to do something different. Really anything that you do will actually develop your skill set as a developer. Thank you, MacPizza one. I'm very glad that you enjoyed this session here. And yeah, I think that is it. So.